Good morning, I'm Jerry Michel. Uh, I'm a PhD researcher here at the uh, European University Institute, and I will present this morning uh, my paper, Radical Rights and the Welfare State, the Electoral Relevance of uh, Welfare Politics. I have to say it's a quite different paper from the two presentations we had before, because it's a theoretical paper, and I will attempt to uh, provide the mechanisms that can link welfare politics, attitudes, interests, and the radical right vote. So I will proceed as followed. Uh, first, I will introduce the research question, and then I will present the two mechanisms that I think can account for uh, the relation between welfare politics and the radical right. And the first mechanism will be protection. The second will be a mechanism of differentiation. And I will end with some uh, concluding remarks. Uh, first, a background on the radical right. The cultural explanations uh, of the radical right votes are the most widespread. Uh, schematically, there are two most prominent issues, uh, diversity, immigration, and the radical right vote is expected to be driven by authoritarianism and uh, opposition to cultural changes. On the other side, there are some uh, economic explanations of this vote, and uh, the first aspect would be the sociological profile of the radical right voters. They are the blue-collar workers, the less well-off individuals. On the supply side, we also see that the radical right parties now provide some economic agendas, and they adapted these agendas to uh, their expected voters. So for instance, we know the radical right uh, stances on the welfare state are now uh, very different from those of the classical right wing. Um, however, in recent studies, we saw that uh, those two dimensions are blurred. They're not so distinct. They might be entangled. So, in this perspective, there's been a rising interest of uh, the study between the relation, the relation between welfare attitudes and the radical right. Now, why would welfare attitudes be relevant to this vote? There might be uh, two reasons for this. First, uh, on the aggregated level, uh, we observed that the welfare regime types, welfare uh, scope and range, uh, tend to mediate uh, the, relation, the um, explanations of radical right support. And also, among these electorates, we see there's a, a high overrepresentation of certain social groups that hold very specific welfare attitudes. That is, for instance, the workers who are most prominently egalitarianism and in favor of uh, redistribution, or the self-employed that are much more in favor of uh, welfare retrenchment. So, uh, De Coster and uh, others in 2012 were a major contribution on this relation between uh, welfare attitudes and the radical right, and they show that the radical right voters have very high scores of welfare chauvinism, welfare populism, but also egalitarianism. And it's not only they, have, they show high scores of these attitudes, it's that these attitudes are significant uh, determinants of this vote. So we're confronted to a research problem, because in these different studies linking welfare attitudes to uh, radical rights are usually limited to a single case study, either one country mostly the Netherlands or uh, Belgium, or uh, one class, so you're looking particularly at the workers' support for the radical right. And most importantly, I think, they lack a theoretical framework, providing, uh, proving that welfare attitudes, such as welfare chauvinism or egalitarianism, are determinants of the vote, is a meaningful result, but it needs a theory behind it. So therefore, this paper uh, is an attempt to bridge two literatures that are usually uh, very much apart, uh, the literature on the radical right vote, and on the other side, the political sociology of the welfare state. So I will not give you a literature review on the, the sociology of the welfare state, but I will pre uh, present two mechanisms that can account for this relation. For this, I will rely on two different approaches of the welfare state. First one will be the so-called piggy bank approach. So it's the conception of the welfare state as an institu institutional setup for risk uh, management. So this implies that individual preferences are defined by self-interest, and I argue that through a mechanism of protection, individuals that are the most at risk will favor the radical right. The other approach is a so-called Robin Hood approach, is uh, where the um, welfare state is an institutional setup for a reallocation of wealth, a reduction of social inequalities, and relies on normative beliefs, more, more than self-interest. So I argue that due to a mechanism of differentiation, um, individuals that target groups that violate those norms are more likely to vote for the radical right. So first I will start with a 
protection approach, the self-risk-based uh, approach, and the main assumption is that individuals' uh, preferences are determined um, by their self-interest. So it's uh, an instrumental uh, relation. The welfare state institutions exist because individuals can maximize their utility by sharing their risks. Now, we know that uh, globalization has revived economic competition. And uh, as a result, some individuals are so-called the losers of globalization. The losers are those that face uh, increasing income instability, unemployment risks, labor market instability. So the argument here is that globalization has increased the economic insecurity of those losers. Now I argue that those losers can assess the process that increased their economic insecurity. They can assess this uh, incre uh, increasing economic insecurity's causes and its consequences. This is why I use a uh, two-sided uh, con uh, two concept of economic insecurity. On the one hand, you have, you have the consequences, the increase of individual economic risk, and the cause, that is the, the cause of globalization, so the rejection, the negative perception of globalization. Now, to this point, uh, economic insecurity is not logically linked to uh, voting for the radical right. Indeed, we could expect that increasing economic insecurity uh, would benefit to the left parties. This would, this would be the common assumptions, but we have two, um, two reasons, two points that point towards the radical right uh, direction. First, as we saw before, uh, it is empirically proven that the radical right voters can be in favor of redistribution, in favor of welfare state development. And second, if we think of the convergence hypothesis that left, central left parties, central right parties tend to converge on economic policies, the, the radical right voters, those whose economic insecurity is increasing, might be uh, willing to choose a party that holds radical positions on economic policies and on globalization. So I argue that uh, radical right parties are status quo parties. Status quo, this means that they are the parties that refuse and confront the structural change. So uh, this is how they can attract the economically uh, insecure voters. The status quo addresses both the dimension of causes, uh, the rejection of globalization, and its consequences, that is, a protection against a changing economy. Now, more specifically, if we look at the causes of uh, economic insecurity, this is a, a mechanism of protection. Uh, the mechanism of protection means rejection of globalization. Now, maybe for some time, um, as uh, following uh, Herbert Kirchhoff's uh, winning formula of the radical right, it was seen that uh, radical right parties were uh, very much in favor of uh, economic uh, liberalism, but the common feature was always to oppose globalization. By essence, these parties uh, are opposed to openness, to trade openness, to international openness. So most frequently this opposition is based on nationalism, but it, it can be a global opposi uh, opposition to openness. Now in terms of uh, individuals, uh, we also know that the lower skilled, the, the workers, the losers of globalization are also those who oppose free trade and immigration. So thus there's a possible match here between those losers of globalization and the radical right. These losers face increasing economic insecurity and they can seek protection by supporting the status quo parties, those that directly confront this process of uh, globalization. In terms of the consequences, uh, the radical right also directly addressed these consequences. Here, so I'm talking about uh, risks of income loss, labor market instability, unemployment risks, and uh, these are all motives to seek for protection. So I, I argue this protection can be uh, found in the support for status quo parties of the radical right. And there, again, are two reasons. First, radical right parties now have adapted their economic agendas to their potential electors. So they are more in favor of redistributive policies. And this is particularly the case if we look at the Nordic uh, populist parties, the Danish People Party, the True Finns, but also now in more classic uh, radical right parties such as Front National, they tend to develop a, a welfare-oriented uh, program. And second, aside from the radical left, the radical right parties are those that frame globalization the most in terms of labor uh, security, social security, social policy. So the radical right parties can capture 
this increasing economic insecurity of the losers of globalization by way of framing and of uh, policy preferences. So I want to sum up this uh, first mechanism of uh, protection that links welfare politics to uh, the radical right. We have economic insecurity as a two-sided concept, and this economic insecurity is growing among the losers of globalization, and their logical answer is a demand for protection. And the radical right provides this protection not only by confronting globalization, but also by addressing individual uh, economic risks. If we think back to um, the two dimensions of the political uh, system, economic and cultural preferences, now we know a lot of those uh, losers of globalization are those that adopt interventionist nationalist preferences, that is in favor of state intervention, welfare redistribution, and national um, uh, opposition to openness. So by promoting a form of status quo, radical right parties can match these preferences. I will now uh, turn to the second approach of welfare politics, a uh, normative conception of the welfare state. This is a very big trend uh, since the 90s uh, to uh, consider that uh, attitudes toward the welfare state preferences cannot be explained only by uh, self-interest. Um, to put it simply, uh, the, the, they argue, the most prominent authors here argue that there is a moral economy of the welfare state. So that is a set of norms that uh, shape and determine individuals' preferences on uh, welfare. So to define these norms, I rely on the literature on the foundations of the welfare state, and there is a pretty broad academic consensus on what uh, these norms are. Uh, the first norm, most important norm maybe, would be social justice. The welfare state at first was very much designed to fight poverty, and uh, now social justice can be extended to this idea of uh, promotion of uh, equality of opportunity. Second very important norm is the norm of reciprocity, it's the main uh, prerequisite for cooperation to the welfare state. The consent to cooperation to the welfare state comes from reciprocity. I can pay my taxes if the others do so. So as that very much relates to the deservingness debate. Who is deserving of welfare benefits? And usually in the studies we see that the most deservings are the elderly because they have contributed to the welfare state their whole life. Last important norms of this uh, moral economy of the welfare state is self-reliance. It has long been the, one of the central narratives of the welfare state. Um, individuals should take care of themselves is the uh, core argument and the welfare state should only be a protection net. So it is very much linked to the idea of efficiency because too great dependency of some individuals will bear a cost on the general welfare. Now, here uh, I will focus on the perception of the norm violation. Much of the literature on norms focuses on individual norm compliance or non-compliance, but in this framework I uh, propose that the most important part is the perception that others' individuals' norms compliance or norm violation really sharps, uh, really uh, influenced the uh, perception uh, that other individuals have. So if you see that someone else is violating these norms, you might be influenced in your uh, attitudes toward the, the welfare state. So the mechanism I propose here is a mechanism of differentiation. Now we know that broad normative beliefs uh, produce different social representations for different social groups. Uh, outgroups are defined, in-groups are defined, the outgroups are very negatively viewed, the in-groups are positively connoted. So the idea is that uh, norm-violating individuals are differentiated. They form a targeted outgroup because they violate some norms, the norm of social justice, reciprocity, or uh, self-reliance. Now, to understand this mechanism, uh, we have to understand why the radical right would be successful among those people that target norm-violating outgroups. And if we look in the literature on the radical right, uh, Jens Hitgen, for, for instance, argues that Radical right parties are, by essence, exclusionary. Now, of course, nationalism is an uh, exclusionary ideology, but we can even think in a broader way and uh, that populism, for instance, is antagonistic by nature. Populism is based on two oppositions. We could say a vertical opposition between the pure people, idealized community, and uh, the corrupt elite, but also a horizontal opposition between this idealized community and a threatening outgroup and in that case, uh, migrants, uh, for instance. Uh, 
So this is the general framework of uh, differentiation, and now I'll go into the specifics of uh, the perception of norm violation and a radical right vote. I found that for each of these violated norms is associated a welfare attitude, and this welfare attitude will lead to um, radical right support. Now, welfare populism, which is uh, treated in this literature, derives from the norm of reciprocity. Some individuals will feel that an outgroup is not contributing its share to the welfare social contract. So the outgroup can be here the welfare scroungers, those that abuse the system, those that get more than they deserve. It can also be a form of corrupted elite. For instance, uh, public servants can be denounced as an elite of the welfare state, uh, those who get the most benefits without necessarily deserving them. So if we think back in the vocabulary of uh, populism, we can see opposition between the, the little guys, the hardworking people, and an outgroup of people who are deemed to usurp um, the welfare state. Uh, this comes back to the distinction between a, what we could call a productive class on one side and the social parasites on the other side. On the other side, and those social parasites, they frequently are the target of the radical right discourse. Now, such perception of norm violation can fuel the radical right. People um, feeling some, some outgroup violates the norm of reciprocity might want to target them. And more specifically, I think welfare chauvinism is a specification of this mechanism. Uh, the outgroup there are the migrants, and they're targeted because they are deemed less entitled to uh, welfare benefits because by nature, they arrive later in the system, they have contributed less, and also, they are perceived to be structurally dependent, so perceived to depend a lot on the, on the welfare benefits. So welfare chauvinism here, as one of the central uh, features of uh, radical right voting, can be defined in terms of norm violation. Now, in terms of the, for the norm of self-reliance, uh, we know that the welfare dependents are very negatively viewed. Uh, in the libertarian economic tradition, the welfare state deemed to corrupt the citizens to, by fostering dependency. And here, uh, the perception leads to macro level. The more dependent citizens, the less efficient the welfare state is. So the targeted R group would be the welfare dependents, those that we see in the radical right discourse that are deemed as lazy. So because the welfare state allows them to be dependent, to be lazy, uh, it should be retrenched. So if we go back to Kitchell's idea, sorry, to Kitchell's idea of the winning formula, um, this target uh, group can be responsible for welfare retrenchment. There are uh, the welfare retrenchment of the radical right. There are some people who depend on the welfare state, are lazy, and thus it should be retrenched. So this relation could be especially true for the self-employed, which are a very overrepresented category of the radical right electorate, and might hold uh, such a view. Finally, for the egalitarianism part, uh, egalitarianism is uh, expressed when people feel uh, an outgroup is really precarious. The norm of social justice is violated. So contrary to the other outgroups here, this outgroup, the poorest, can be positively viewed. If we refer to the framework of populism, it can be this uh, imagined, uh, idealized community of the us, the poor member of this idealized community. And this perception can be there particularly re relevant to those less well-off voters for the radical right. Now, these are the, the, this is the different differentiation mechanism for the different violations of norms, and it is very possible that they accumulate, they interact. It's very possible that welfare populism can be uh, associated to welfare retrenchment, and that uh, egalitarianism can be associated to welfare chauvinism. So there are different uh, relations to look into here. Now, as a concluding remark, I don't have uh, time in this presentation to uh, insist on the paramount, paramount impact of institutions. Institutions are a, a central a key uh, actor here. Of course, they uh, shape economic insecurity by providing uh, different welfare benefits, but they also shape those normative beliefs. So this is a central feature that I could not present here. Now, in this paper, I hope to uh, bridge two literatures that are uh, usually not associated and provide individual level mechanisms that link the welfare attitudes to uh, this radical right vote. Now, uh, for discussion, of course, this is a theoretical paper, so it will need empirical testing, um, and 
one of the important questions, I think, would be exactly the impact of the Great Recession. It surely impacts economic insecurity, but also the different norms of this moral economy, which norm is the most important, the perception of norm violations, who are those uh, groups that violate these norms. So the, the interesting idea could be to measure change in uh, these relations of protection and differentiation before and after the crisis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.